uh, this is the launch. Oh, great. This is the launch of uh, this year's Distinguished Visiting Lecture Series um, in the Department of Psychiatry. I uh, want to welcome you here. And also, we are streaming to the VA and the SFG. So uh, I think we're trying to get a two-way thing going, but I think today it's only one way, but um, we're, we're working on it. Um, so uh, today, I, I have the great pleasure. Good morning. Hey, Sam. How are you? <laughs> We can start now. Um, the, the great pleasure of being able to um, uh, to introduce our inaugural speaker for this year's series, uh, Kelsey Martin, MD, PhD, um, a truly extraordinary scientist and academic leader, and dean of the School of, uh, of David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Martin is a professor of biological chemistry and of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences, and the first woman to be named dean of the UCLA School of Medicine. It is the only disappointing part of this introduction that uh, she notably is still among just a handful of women medical school deans in the United States. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree in English um, and American language uh, at Harvard University and then decided uh, to head off to the Peace Corps, uh, where she was uh, stationed in the uh, Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. Um, there she was uh, in a village where I understand uh, she became aware of an annual measles epidemic that was killing children. She successfully um, garnered funding in order to be able to institute a, a vaccination program uh, and eradicated uh, the uh, epidemic. And again, my understanding is that this led to uh, her interest in uh, pursuing the intersection of medicine and science. Uh, she returned to uh, the U.S. where she did an MD-PhD at Yale, um, and then uh, after Yale um, uh, decided to head off to work with a little-known uh, New York City psychiatrist. Uh, Eric Kandel um, at uh, Columbia University. Um, not even any smiles come on. He's a no <laughs> so, I was going to say a little-known analyst. I think he, he actually underwent analysis, is my understanding. Um, so anyway, um, Dr. Martin, uh, great to great effect, yes. Um, uh, Dr. Martin joined the faculty in, uh, at UCLA in 1999 has remained there since. Uh, she launched immediately a world-class program of research integrating uh, cell biology and molecular and electrophysiological approaches to study plasticity uh, and memory, and you'll hear uh, more about that today. Um, and if groundbreaking work as a neuroscientist uh, was not enough throughout her academic career, she's taken on a series of increasingly uh, ambitious and challenging uh, leadership roles uh, in academia, including the chair of uh, the Department of Biological Chemistry, interim dean at UCLA, a School of Medicine executive vice dean, associate vice chancellor, and now dean of the School of Medicine. Uh, she's made an explicit commitment as dean to fostering a community of openness and tolerance. Um, and particularly in promoting cross-disciplinary cooperation and collaboration, including um, particularly among uh, the neurosciences. Um, uh, she has a major emphasis on developing uh, programs in uh, precision medicine at UCLA. Um, and she's also underscored uh, the importance of focusing on the social determinants of health and has prioritized UCLA School of Medicine's contribution uh, to serving the community. I don't know how you managed not to be at UCSF. You sound like um, one of ours. There you go. Nice applause. But um, uh, UCLA is uh, fortunate to have you. She's received, not surprisingly, um, numerous awards. Uh, including being uh, elected in 2016 to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and to the National Academy of Medicine. It's a singular honor to have you here, uh, Dr. Martin. Thank you so much for launching our 2019-2020 uh, lectureship series. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matt. It's really lovely to be here. I love kicking off a two-year series of women scientists. Wonderful. Uh, UCLA is a sister campus to UCSF. We have a city in need down in the south, too. So um, <laughs> anyway, it's um, lovely to be here. And I'm going to talk today about the research in my lab where we're really interested in how does experience change connectivity in the brain. We think about it in the context of storing long-term memories, but as psychiatrists, plasticity is really at the basis of any kind of behavioral change that's induced by experience. So we think about plasticity very much as cell biologists. And the interesting the sort of handle that we use is the recognition from work that was done um, 
years, decades ago, including work from Sam Barandas, that showed that long-lasting forms of plasticity and memory require new gene expression. And also that long-term plasticity, despite this requirement for new gene expression, can occur in a synapse-specific, or at least in a, you know, a group of synapses within a given neuron. And from a cell biologist perspective, this raises a number of very distinct um, challenges. So we know a lot about how activity regulates gene expression in cells like lymphocytes that are not polarized, where you have signals that go to the nucleus, turn on gene expression, the products change the proteome um, of the cytoplasm, but in a neuron, this becomes more challenging. So here, looking in a Purkinje neuron, a signal that might be received at a very distal synapse has to travel back to the cell body and into the nucleus to impact transcription. And if those changes in gene expression are intended to alter the structure and function of just specific a subset of synapses, then there's the question of how is that gene expression spatially regulated within the neuron? And those are really the two questions that my lab focuses on. Um, and again, I'm talking about gene expression as kind of a catch-all, but gene expression is a much, you know, has many, many distinct steps within it. Again, you have a, a ligand that will be bind to a receptor. That signal has to be re, uh, transmitted from the plasma membrane into the uh, nucleus of the cell. It has to regulate um, transcriptions of genes from the DNA. The RNAs that are synthesized undergo processing, export into the cytoplasm, localization to specific regions within the cytoplasm. The RNA is regulated at the level of stability. Um, and, the, and the translation of that RNA into protein is also regulated. The, um, uh, there's uh, regulation of the stability of the protein and also regulation of the function of the protein by post-translational modification. So all of these different steps have the potential to impact um, how uh, experience changes um, connectivity in the brain. So today I'm going to tell you two stories. One, I'm going to tell you stories about a, a particular activity-dependent um, the, the activity dependent transport of a particular transcriptional co-regulator that travels from the synapse to the nucleus. Um, and then I'm going to turn to tell you about uh, post-transcriptional regulation by a cytoplasmic RNA binding protein. And I have to say that I see three former UCLA MSTP students in this room now, so yeah, we're doing good. Um, all right, so um, this first question, how do signals get from the synapse to the nucleus? It's, um, neurons are specialized for rapid signaling between uh, different compartments of the cell by electrochemical signaling. But we're really interested in this question of how can a soluble um, molecule or signaling molecule travel the long distance along a, um, a neuronal process into the nucleus and then get into the nucleus and impact gene expression? And I became interested in that question when I was a postdoc with that little known, um, very shortly analyzed <laughs> um, Eric Kandel, where I was interested in this question of how do you get synapse-specific forms of plasticity and set up a really simple culture system using aplesia neurons where there was a sensor neuron with a bifurcated process that contacted two spatially separated motor neurons and found that if I applied serotonin to the connections that were made onto this motor neuron, that induced a long-lasting spaced applications of serotonin, induced a long-lasting um, increase in synaptic strength at that branch without any change at this branch. And that required the transport of molecules from the stimulated site back to the nucleus of the sensory neuron. You needed transcription. It didn't involve depolarization. And we, we learned some of the signaling molecules, like MAP kinase, that traveled back. It also involved the tra translation of RNAs that were localized out in the sensory neuride. So when I started my lab, one of the areas I wanted to work on is what are those signals that get back to the nucleus and how do they get back? I was interested in the idea that perhaps they, unlike electrochemical signaling, provided some information about the site of stimulation. And I'm going to tell you about the work that was started by a, post, a former postdoc in my lab, To Yan Ching, who now has his own lab in Singapore. And he looked at transcriptional regulators whose activity was 
was controlled by nucleocytoplasmic trafficking. And so one of those was CRTC1, which is CREB regulated transcriptional co-regulator. We knew that CREB was important for that um, uh, conversion of short to long-term memory. And CRTC1 had been studied by Mark Montmany and Mark Labau and non-neuronal cells and was shown to localize in the cytoplasm of cells in a phosphorylated state where it was bound to 1433 anchoring proteins. And then when there was a signal that, that led to a coincident elevation in calcium and in cyclic AMP, that calcium activated phosphatase as the cyclic AMP inhibited kinases so that you had a persistently dephosphorylated CRTC1. And the dephosphorylated CRTC1 translocated into the nucleus bound CREB and very potently by about 1,500 fold induced transcription of CREB dependent genes. And so Toyen asked whether or not where CRTC was in neurons and what he found was if you look in a, a hippocampal slice from a mouse and you look here in the CA1 region and you look in the basal stain, you can see that most of the CRTC1 is present in the dendrites uh, and you can see these ghosts of the nuclei where there's really no detectable CRTC1. If you use the protocol called to induce uh, LTP uh, in the slices um, and looked an hour later, he saw this massive translocation of CRTC1 into the CA1 um, nuclei. If he looked in cultured neurons where you could really more sort of uh, with higher resolution localize where CRTC1 was, was, was localized, um, he found here showing in green it, that CRTC1 was present in, in silence neurons in the um, dendrites, but also um, in synaptic spines, so in postsynaptic regions. Um, this, these experiments were uh, done looking at endogenous CRTC1 in snapshots, and he wanted to really show that the CRTC1 traveled that long distance because, of course, it could have been degraded in the cytoplasm and accumulated in the nucleus. And so what he did was he um, expressed CRTC1 fused to a photoconvertible fluorescent protein, Dendra 2. So that's a fluorophore that's normally green, but you give a short UV light and it turns red. So he expressed that in neurons. Um, and he also put in caged glutamate in the medium. So the, it's caged, it's not functional. You give a UV uh, light and it, it removes the cage so that you now uh, can uh, stimulate with glutamate. So what he would do is he'd express this, and then in a neuron, he'd give a UV light at a distal dendritic segment so that he was both photoconverting the CRTC1 from green to red and also stimulating those synapses. And then he'd uh, image to see if ever that distal CRTC1 translocated into the nucleus. And doing these sorts of experiments, if you look, you can see that here it's in green. There's no red signal. If you go out about 200 microns and you photoconvert, you now see the appearance of red. There's, we haven't gotten rid of all the green. And then you look through the nucleus and you look at a zero time point. There's no CRTC in the nucleus, but by about 10 minutes, you're detecting that photoconverted CRTC1. And so using that setup, he went through and really kind of dissected the mechanisms by which stimulation led to the translocation of CRTC1 uh, from the synapse. And you could see that if you mock on cage, that it primarily stays out in the distal dendrite. Um, if you uncage glutamate, you see that um, accumulation in the nucleus that's consistent with the rate of fast axonal transport. Um, and if you block here NMDA and uh, AMPA receptors, you also block that translocation. So you know from this experiment, it requires NMDA and AMPA receptors. And using this type of experiment, in addition to NMDA receptors, he found that you needed local, um, you needed L-type voltage-gated calcium channels and very local calcium influx so it was blocked by BAFTA, but not by EGTA. It required active transport along the microtubules using a dining motor protein. So if you block the dining motor protein, there's no translocation. And he found that it was dependent on an NLS that he identified here, uh, this region, which on its own, if you put it in another cell, in another protein, will drive that protein into the nucleus. Uh, one of the features that he uh, found when he was working on CRTC1 is that its uh, molecular weight, its mobility on a one-dimensional gel changed massively when you stimulated it. And when he looked at the protein, he found that it was highly enriched in serines and threonines, and so he then looked by a two-dimensional gel and what he found shown in green here is that if you silence um, cultured neurons, you see that CRTC1 is 
of a higher molecular weight in this dimension and is also towards the acidic isoelectric point, so it's if it, consistent with it being phosphorylated. And then a 15-minute stimulation um, uh, with uh, GABA receptor inhibitors by cuculin to drive glutamatergic stimulation leads to this decrease in molecular weight and the generation of a number of species that are towards the um, basic isoelectric point consistent with being dephosphorylated. And if you take the lysate and you simply uh, treat it with a phosphatase, it collapses down to that low molecular weight um, basic isoelectric point. And there are um, additional um, modifications, including acetylation, um, and, and more recently other types of modifications that have been identified. But clearly there's a, a really complex uh, pattern of phosphorylation that is altered by activity, by glutamatergic activity. So Martina DeSalvo, when she was a graduate student in the lab, did um, uh, um, mass spec with James Wolfschlegel to identify uh, phosphorylated residues in CRTC1, and she did this in neurobl mouse neuroblastoma cell line, and she identified 50 different sites that were consistently phosphorylated and that are very highly conserved um, across species. Uh, we've, this is really um, too many sites to analyze by mutagenesis or by making phospho-specific antibodies, but she has identified the three sites that I've um, highlighted here with the asterisks as being required for the, um, the dephosphorylation is required for releasing from the 1433 protein and driving into the nucleus. So if you make mutants from the shearing to an alanine so they look like they're unphosphorylated, that constitutively goes to the nucleus. Uh, but we remain very interested in what these other sites are. And one of the hypotheses that we had was that it could be that different patterns of phosphorylation might couple different uh, patterns of synaptic activity with specific programs of gene expression. So for example, if different synaptic signals come in, that could lead to different um, uh, different codes of, of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, and this le could lead to binding of CRTC1 to CREB at different promoter elements or even to other transcription factors, in particular to other BZIP transcription factors. And so to test this hypothesis, um, uh, Siobhan Bonanno, a graduate student in the lab, and Jenny Akiro uh, began to look at different plasticity-inducing protocols to see whether or not they induce dephosphorylation. And so shown here, for example, if we look at induction of LTD or LTP in hippocampal slices and then look in the CA1 region by an immunoblot, what we can show is um, you see a drop in the molecular weight of total CRTC, both with LTP and LTD. And if we use an antibody that's, that is a phospho-specific antibody against one of those sites that's required for the nuclear translocation, you can see that it's dephosphorylated under both protocols. And then Jenny Akira, a postdoc in the lab, uh, did a number of experiments where she took hippocampal slices and then induced either uh, high-frequency LTP, uh, theta burst LTP, or low-frequency LTD, and then asked whether or not CRTC1 translocated into the nucleus under those conditions in CA1 neurons. And in addition, in a, in a slightly different experiment where we're interested in the role of catecholamines in inducing transcription uh, in the hippocampus during plasticity. She also opted genetically stimulated LC fibers from the locus ceruleus, uh, for fiber, catecholaminergic fibers from the locus ceruleus into CA1 and found that those also in, uh, induced this accumulation of CRTC1 in the nucleus, especially profound with uh, LTP and uh, theta burst LTP and LTD. So um, that, we thought, well, let's use this to ask which genes are um, the CRTC1 regulate during these various forms of plasticity. Um, and we decided to, um, after a lot of trial and error, to use uh, chemical pharmacological approaches to induce the plasticity so that we could increase the signal to noise in our experiments. And so the three approaches that we used were a chemical LTP protocol that involves elevation of cyclic AMP, of calcium, um, and NMDA receptor blockade um, uh, opening, and then um, 
uh, a DHPG-induced LTD, and then an NMDA-receptor-induced LTD protocol. Uh, we did these uh, in a number of slices in an interface chamber, uh, checked that, that the actual plasticity was induced, and then took the slices and did uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation to ask where is the CRTC1 binding, and also RNA-seq to ask what transcripts are changing. And actually, we were very surprised that in the literature there's very little about uh, changes in um, the transcriptome in particular after LTD, and there's very little comparing different forms of plasticity, something that I assumed I would be able to find very easily, but uh, wasn't available. Um, so uh, what we found, uh, we identified a number of CRTC1 seq peaks. Uh, the majority were present in enhancers, so um, we defined enhancers as anything that was uh, greater than 1 kb. I guess I put the slime wrong, away from the transcription start site. And then we used another number of other criteria looking at databases that had uh, histone marks that were consistent with being enhancers, for example. Uh, and about 25, 26% were uh, present at promoter elements. The primary binding site was at CREB, uh, and that was enriched with the promoter elements. ATF4 was present at all the peaks, and June FOSS uh, AP1 was present predominantly at the enhancer elements. Uh, all of these uh, uh, the binding was really at the peak of the um, of the uh, uh, the motif binding site. When we look for plasticity induced changes in chip seq, what we found is that the majority were in, in enhancer elements, which is consistent with a lot of data that's come out of Mike Greenberg's lab. At promoter elements, 100 of them were at PREV binding sites. At enhancers, 70%. Um, the top binding motif was June uh, FOSS at the enhancer motifs. So when we ask, you know, what is changing, and I'm not, you know, giving you lists here, but I'm giving you this just to look at a pattern, because what was really striking is there are, this is the top differentially expressed CRTC1 chip seek peaks of each of, sorry, of each of the um, uh, plasticity-inducing protocols compared to um, uh, artificial cerebrospinal fluid. And what you'll notice is that the changes are largely all the same. They just different magnitudes of change. Uh, when we looked at the RNA-seq data, this is just at 30 minutes, they're not dramatic changes, but again, uh, with the exception of really one uh, or maybe two genes, the, um, the changes are pretty much all the same, just different magnitudes of, of, of change. So uh, in summary, what I've shown you here is that uh, CRTC1 travels from the synapse, from a stimulated synapse to the nucleus, um, and that it, once it gets into the nucleus, it, it regulates crab-dependent transcription and actually the transcription of other bees of transcription factors. Um, that uh, it, it undergoes this very complex regulation of CRTC1 uh, phosphorylation. And um, what I haven't told you, and one of the reasons we're looking at the catecholaminergic, is that, that once it's phosphorylated, uh, once it's in the nucleus in a dephosphorylated state, the rephosphorylation and the exit from the nucleus is regulated by cyclic AMP levels and so regulated by catecholamines. And so the persistence of that um, glutamatergic induced translocation is regulated by neuromodulation. But when we looked at what are the changes, is there specificity in the changes in gene expression that we're seeing? So far, and we're still an enormous amount of data that we're analyzing, um, pretty much the three forms of plasticity do similar changes at different amplitudes. And that really, for us, raised the question of how is that specificity of the stimulus to the transcriptional response induced? And you know, as I think about this, and I, this is a thinking in pro progress or work in progress, it made me think deeply about a couple of other experiments in the lab that I'm going to describe, but that serve as a, a transition point for the next part of this talk. And um, these were experiments that we did in one case with a, a graduate student, Sung Mok Kim, where we took those aplysia culture setups with bifurcated process. 
And we either paired it with a sensory neuron where it made a synapse, so you can see a beautiful EPSP, or where it fasciculated, but it didn't make a chemical synapse because it's not a target motor neuron in the animal, so you stimulate, there's no EPSP. Or we put it with two target motor neurons, but stimulated one of them, so we had plasticity at, at that branch. And then we looked at RNAs that we knew were transcriptionally upregulated and localized. And what we found is that when the RNAs were induced by either synapse formation or synaptic stimulation, they were induced transcriptionally, and they were transported out throughout the neuron. But they were only translated at the site that was stimulated or at the site of a synapse. In another experiment, uh, Patrick Chen, when he was a, a graduate student in the lab, did experiments in hippocampal slices, induced LTP, and then looked at different time points, at gene expression using RNA sequencing, and also using translating ribosome affinity purification, so TRAP-seq, which is a proxy, not a perfect proxy, but a proxy for RNAs that are being translated. And what he found, and this is just showing at one time point at an hour, that there were many more changes and higher amplitude changes at the level of trap seat, so at the level of the proxy for translational regulation than there were at the level of RNA seat, which again, it's a proxy for transcription because it's also regulated by stability of the RNA. And so taking these together really, um, you know, leads to a, a thought that these different forms of plasticity are inducing very similar program, transcriptional programs. And then the specificity may well then be induced at the level of post-transcriptional modes of regulation. That the induction of the transcription is really more or less to set that neuron in a state of readiness so it has these induced transcripts, whether they're localized or whether they're in the soma, that can then be made into, into protein. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to move on to the second part, which is really this question of how is gene expression spatially restricted to synapses? So you have induced all of these mRNAs, um, and the idea is you're going to get plasticity at some subcellular compartment in the cell. So how is it that you achieve that with a, with a um, cell-wide induction at the level of transcription? And um, again, from this work in Aplesia, we knew that one mechanism involved the transport of RNAs out into the sensory neurite and the regulation of their stability and their translation. And over many years, we've done a lot of work to look at what are the signals in those RNAs that lead to their transport, that regulate their stability, that regulate uh, whether or not they're translated, what are the signaling pathways that lead to either degradation or plasticity. And in each case, what one ends up focusing on are specific RNA elements, and then, of course, specific RNA binding proteins that bind to those RNA elements. And so several years, so, so this work really um, you know, has, along with many of my colleagues, led to this idea that in neurons, this idea of sort of decentralized gene expression is particularly important because of the morphology and the incredible compartmentalization of neurons. So um, many years ago, we started working on a particular RNA binding protein called RBFOX1 or A2BT1, um, or, which is for ataxin 2 binding protein 1. Uh, and the reason we looked at RBFOX1 is, you know, in part because it has mutations in RBFOX1 have been associated with a number of neuropsychiatric diseases, including epilepsy, um, intellectual disability, and autism spectrum disorders, but also um, as an experimentalist, um, it was especially appealing to us because RBFOX1 is known to bind to a very distinct um, RNA element, uh, UGC-AUG, so you, one can very easily bioinformatically identify potential targets of RBFOX1, and when we did that, one of the things that we noticed is that although Traditionally, RBFOX1, if you still, I think if you still look in OMIM, it's defined as a splicing factor. 
when we bioinformatically looked for targets, we found a very large number where the elements were in the three prime untranslated region. So more consistent with RBFOX1 playing a role in the post-transcriptional regulation of its target mRNAs. So there are three different uh, RBFOX1 uh, it proteins in, in vertebrates, RBFOX1, 2, and 3, and they're all expressed in neurons. Um, and uh, again, another really useful tool for us was that RBFOX1 itself was spliced into a cytoplasmic and a nuclear isoform. So if you look at the isoform that includes this exon 19, it has this C-terminal tail, and that's the cytoplasmic variant. If you express this as a cDNA in here in hex cells, you can see in red that all the RBFOX1 localizes to the cytoplasm. If exon 19 is excluded, it generates an isoform that has this C-terminal tail, which is a nuclear isoform. And if you express that as a cDNA in hex cells, it's all present in the nucleus. So we realized that this was a really nice tool for us to take the same protein that has a different, just a different C-terminal tail, but the same RNA binding site motifs in its, in its sequence, and ask what's the function in the nucleus and what's the function in the cytoplasm. And so this was the work from a, a postdoc, Jian Li, and a former graduate student in my colleague, Doug Black's lab, Celine Vuong. And first they asked, well, okay, so there is a cytoplasmic isoform, but is it even expressed at levels that are of any significance? And so looking in mouse hippocampus and cortex, you can see um, on a gel, if you look at the cytoplasmic isoform, where you include that exon 19, it can be uh, it's, it, it's separated from the nuclear isoform that excludes that exon. So if you look at P0 and at three weeks, you can see that there's about half as much uh, uh, nuclear and cytoplasmic isoform at the RNA level. That's also true at the protein level. And so um, what the, this is to the RNA, I haven't shown you the protein. So we knew that yeah, indeed this is a, a significant fraction of the protein. Um, and so we thought, well, let's manipulate those two isoforms in neurons. But we were concerned that there are three RBFOX1, 1, 2, and 3. They all bind to the same targets. So we wanted to make sure that RBFOX2 and RBFOX3 were not also present in the cytoplasm. So we used a sort of old-fashioned cell biology experiment where we culture neurons and we then uh, uh, permeabilized them with the plant metabolite digitonin, which replaces cholesterol in the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane is rich in cholesterol, but the nuclear membrane is not. And so you can leak out everything from the cytoplasm, but you keep the nucleus intact. Um, and it's a way that nuclear localization signals were first identified by setting up these permeabilized cells. And so when we took neurons and we permeabilized them with digitonin, we found that RBFOX1 leaked out into the cytoplasm. You see there are many bands. They're all RBFOX1. You'll see in a little bit a knockout mouse where they're all gone. Um, then we, uh, we lyse all the rest with RIPA. And so it's nucleus, but it's also a lot of cytoplasm. Uh, RBFOX2, we don't see anything in the cytoplasm, but RBFOX3, we see quite a bit in the cytoplasm. And just as we were doing these experiments, a paper came out showing that there is a cytoplasmic RBFOX3 isoform. And we, when we express that, in hex cells, we find that here the cytoplasmic isoform is in the cytoplasm, the nuclear isoform is in the nucleus. So we decided we had to target both RBFOX1 and RBFOX3. And the way that we did that is that we cultured neurons, and then we knocked down both RBFOX1 and RBFOX3 with siRNA, and we achieved very efficient knockdown. So here's um, uh, the, the scrambled uh, RNAs and the non-targeting, and here's uh, RBFOX1 and RBFOX2 with the siRNAs. And so you've lost that signal. And then we rescued with an adenovirus that expressed either the nuclear or the cytoplasmic isoform. So we could detect what are the changes in the transcriptome that are induced by the nuclear versus the cytoplasmic isoform. Um, and we did that using RNA sequencing. And so what these experiments showed us is if we look, when we overexpress the nuclear isoform, if we look at splicing, so in the dark uh, purple here, dark blue, um, 
That had a dramatic effect on the number of axons whose splicing was regulated, much less so for if we overexpress just the cytoplasmic um, isoform. In contrast, when we over when we virally express the cytoplasmic isoform in the absence of any RBFOX1, the primary effect was on expression. So it was on the abundance of RNAs in RNA-seq. Very little effect on the splicing of RBFOX1 targets. Okay, so that told us that the cytoplasmic iso that this nuclear isoform is expected seemed to impact splicing, but the cytoplasmic isoform seemed to impact the abundance of the of its targets in the cytoplasm. And we thought, well, these these siRNA experiments are six days long. There's some impact of the cytoplasmic on splicing. It could be indirect. And so we wanted to do experiments where we actually looked at the physical binding of RBFOX1 to its RNAs, target RNAs. And so Gian did experiments where he did uh, uh, um, cross-linking immunoprecipitation with antibodies against RBFOX1, pull out the RNAs that it binds to, and you sequence those. But he combined that with cell fractionation. So in this type of an experiment, you UV cross-link the cells so that the RNA binding proteins are cross-linked to their target RNAs, and then we fractionated, and we fractionated into chromatin fractions, nucleoplasm fractions, and cytoplasmic fractions, immunoprecipitated and did RNA sequencing. And um, not surprisingly, the chromatin fractions were really clean, and the cytoplasmic fractions were really clean, and the nucleoplasmics were not. I sort of knew that would happen, because every time you do an experiment like that, you break open the nuclei, things leak in and leak out. So I'm showing you the results from the chromatin, where we found that almost all of the binding sites were in the introns, again, consistent with being involved in splicing, whereas in the cytoplasm, almost all the sites we're in the 3 prime ETR, consistent with the post-transcriptional regulation at the level of stability or translation. So then what we did is we compared all of the um, uh, genes whose expression was increased when we um, uh, virally express cytoplasmic RBFX1, all the genes whose expression was decreased, and the fact that there are more of these led us to think that the primary effect, and together with some luciferous assays that we did, was to increase the stability in the translation of the targets. And then we compared them with the, the iClip results, where we actually showed physical binding to target RNAs. And this led us to identify what we call our 109 high, high confidence targets of cytoplasmic RBFOX1. Um, these actually turned out to be highly enriched in uh, genes involved in autism spectrum disorders in the Simons collection, for example. But for somebody who's interested in plasticity, they also were incredibly compelling. So here are some of the targets that we found. There's a very large number of transcripts from the CAM kinase signaling pathway, neuropeptide Y, VAMP1 or synaptobrevin1, ion channels um, as well. And I'm going to tell you just a story about VAMP1, and the reason we looked at VAMP1 is because it is one of the most robustly changed genes in the presence or absence of cytoplasmic RBFOX1, and so it was really easy to study. And so if you look, for example, here is the eye clip, where you look at where is the binding of RBFOX1 to the, to the VAMP1 RNA. So you can see here is the 3' ETR. These are, these are uh, these uh, UGC, AUG elements, and you can see that there's really beautiful binding of RBFOX1 to those elements. And then we took advantage of a, um, a, a Nest and Cree RBFOX1 knockout mouse that had been developed in Doug Black's lab, where we looked at, uh, if you look at the um, signal for VAMP1, here's the VAMP1 gene, and you can see in the wild type, you see lots of reads. If you look in the knockout, you see that there's a great reduction in the amount of RNA for uh, VAMP1. And if you look at the protein level in the RBFOX1 knockout, so here's the wild type, lots of RBFOX1. Here's the Nest and Cree knockout. It's gone. And then you look at VAMP1, and you see there's lots of RBFOX, I mean, yeah, lots of VAMP1. 
Um, and then you look in the hippocampus and the cortex, the amount of protein is greatly reduced. So the lack of RBFOX1 is leading to a very strong decrease in the amount of AMP1. That's not true in the cerebellum, and we don't understand why, but it certainly is true in the hippocampus and the cortex. So AMP1, which is also known as synaptobrevin 1, is a direct target of RBFOX1 and of specifically cytoplasmic RBFOX1. So what is VAMP-1? Uh, VAMP-1 is a V-snare that's involved in synaptic vesicle release. Um, of, you have synaptic vesicles that have to dock and release the neurotransmitters at, their, at the plasma membrane. Synaptic brevin or VAMP-1 is actually the target of, of botulinum toxin. It's required for that release. Well, most of, um, uh, and, and actually that was, uh, interesting to us because in an early paper from the Black Lab that looked at the Nestin RBFOX1 knockout mouse, the phenotype that they found was that they showed increased excitability and seizure susceptibility. So if you look at the behavioral seizure score, here are the knockouts. If you look at an input-output curve, here are the knockouts. So they're more excitable, they're more prone to seizures. So the idea that an, a protein that's involved in synaptic vesicle release is being regulated by a cytoplasmic RNA binding protein, and that in the absence of that RNA binding protein, you're seeing a phenotype that involves increased excitability, led us to think that this could be functionally important. So we look, we took the um, RBFOX1 knockout mice, and we cultured their neurons and measured EPSCs and IPSCs. And what we found is that we saw no change in the amplitude of the IPSCs or the EPSCs, but we saw a decrease in the frequency of both EPSCs and IPSCs. Now, there was something interesting about this because most people study VAMP2. So when you read all the literature about synaptic brevin, it's about VAMP2, very little about VAMP1. And when we looked at what was available in the literature, it suggested that it may not be present at excitatory neurons, and so we went to look. And what we found is if you look here in cultured neurons where we stain for VAMP1, and we also stain for markers of inhibitory or, glutam or, or excitatory synapses, what we find is that it co-localizes with the inhibitory markers. You get this beautiful registration but it didn't co-localize with the markers of excitatory synapses, so it's not present. So this told us that VAMP1 was enriched at inhibitory synapses. So we have a, a protein that's regulated by a cytoplasmic RNA binding protein that's involved in synaptic vesicle release that's primarily at inhibitory neurons, and the absence of which leads to uh, a, a epilepsy a phenotype. So we did the same experiments now knocking down VAMP1 in cultured neurons and measuring EPSCs and IPSCs. And again, just as with the RBFOX1 uh, knockout animal, what we found is there was no decrease in the amplitude of the um, IPSCs or the EPSCs. But if we knock down uh, VAMP1, we got a decrease in the frequency. And if we then rescued with a um, resistant, and that's not a resistant um, VAMP1, we rescued that decrease in the, in the frequency. And then Celine did an experiment that I was sure would never work um, because it was too simplistic. <laughs> and what she did was she took, um, she microinjected uh, viruses that expressed either just a, a fluorescent protein or um, or, or VAMP1 into uh, the hippocampus of RBFOX1 knockout mice. And the idea was, will that rescue this effect? So in other words, is VAMP1 such an important target of RBFOX1 that just, just uh, manipulating its target will rescue that phenotype? And so she did these experiments and um, in, in a really beautifully controlled way where you do the, um, uh, in both uh, the wild type and in the knockout, you do one hippocampus with the, just the fluorescent uh, uh, overexpression and the second with the rescue with VAMP1. And what she found, again, as I showed, if you, um, if you 
uh, have a knockout and you just you don't rescue it, you're just putting in a fluorescent protein, you get a decrease in the frequency both at the IPSC and the EPSC, but if you put in the rescue resistant FAMP1, you now completely rescue that phenotype in the RBFOX1. And there's something interesting about this, which is that what you used for a promoter was a promoter that was just expressed in the inhibitory neurons. So expression of this target of RBFOX1 in the inhibitory neurons rescued both the IPSCs and the EPSCs. And we don't understand how that is. There must be an indirect effect in this, at the circuit level. Um, so um, to sort of summarize here, what I've shown you is that here is a, a um, RNA binding protein an RNA binding protein that's known, mutations are known to be involved in a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders. That RNA binding protein is present in the nucleus, but it's also present in the cytoplasm. One of the targets is the VAMP1 or synaptic Brevin RNA. It has known RBFOX1 binding sites. I haven't shown you the data that we found that one of the ways that this stabilizes the transcript and promotes its translation is that it competes with binding of a microRNA to an adjacent overlapping microRNA binding site. So in the wild type, there's this beautiful balance between the microRNA and the RNA binding protein. So you have balanced expression of this important synaptic vesicle V snare, and you have a, a great balance between excitation and inhibition. If you knock out RBFOX1, now, there's no RBFOX1 to bind to the VAMP1 RNA. MIR9 does bind, and this gets degraded. There's no translation. And so now you get this mismatch of increased excitation and uh, over inhibition. If you rescue with a rescue uh, a resistant VAMP1, and by resistant, it doesn't bind MIR9, so it can be expressed and not degraded, you recover that balance. So here, um, an RNA binding protein that we know works in the, in the nucleus by regulating um, splicing of a number of really interesting targets. We've also shown has a very important role in the cytoplasm by regulating the stability of a target mRNA in a way that's going to regulate synaptic function. And I, you know, for me, as I you know, think about how to put all this together, again, I, I, I can't help but think that what the nucleus is doing is just generating a lot of product because neurons have these incredible morphologies where what is important is having cues that arrive at specific sites within that dendritic arbor that are going to change the structure and function of that particular site. And really for that to happen requires a localized post-transcriptional form of regulation. All right, so I want to thank the people um, in my lab. I've talked about the work of Siobhan Bonanno and Jenny Akiro. Um, the other people in the lab contribute in many different ways, and I want to thank also my collaborators today. I've talked about work that we've done with Tom O'Dell, who is a slice electrophysiologist, actually postdoc with me in the Kandel lab, um, and with uh, Doug Black, um, and especially with Celine Vuong, and work I didn't talk about with the postdoc Andre Damianov. Um, work I haven't talked about with other collaborators, and I want to thank my funding sources, and I'm happy to answer questions. So you didn't talk about time scales. Yeah. So, so how long does it take to go from the nucleus to the dendrites, yeah. and how long does it last? I don't know the answer to it. So it's actually been hard to figure out. We do know, for example, in the first part I talked about CRTC1, that it leaves, if you don't have uh, um, uh, catecholamines or if you don't elevate cyclic AMP artificially, that it leaves the nucleus very quickly. We've been trying to follow where it goes. We don't know how quickly it takes to get back out. That, so I can't answer that question. Um, I believe, you know, when you look at how long it takes RNAs to be transported out, it's, you know, it's, it's axonal transport rates. It's not that long. And so the idea really, and when you look at a lot of the localized RNA literature, RNAs are localized, but they're sequestered. So they're available when they need to be available. Um, 
I do think that you know there is a question of what is the role for this post-transcriptional regulation because there are a lot of changes that are happening on a very short time scale. And so there have to be mechanisms that involve post-translational modification, that involve changes in cytoskeleton, and the issue is those will allow that change in function and stru uh, structure and function over a certain time domain, and then to have it persist requires this. And so I can tell you that you know, a long time ago, uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> in Aplesia, we did do experiments where we looked at what happens if we, if we um, cut off the cell body. So in Aplesia, the processes will survive for quite a long time without the cell body, and they'll actually form synapses. So you can stimulate the axon, and you can record an APSB in the motor neuron. And you can get plasticity, but it will last for 24 hours. It won't last any longer than that. And so that, again, is really consistent with this idea that there have to be these local changes that happen very quickly and that sustain the plasticity over a shorter period of time. And then that has to be accompanied by a longer change that requires it. So I think that's what you were asking. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, this comes out a lot of um, RNA proteins that just go everywhere. And these synapses that were the ones that were not basically uh, activated uh, don't uh, utilize this information. But does it make them prime for plasticity, uh, even though they haven't been prime initially the ones that were? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's, to me, that's an interesting idea, right? It means that there is something about, people do experiments like do c staining to see what neurons are activated after behavioral stimulation. And, and what you're looking at is maybe what neurons are primed to undergo changes. But, yeah. Yeah. It's going to take me a minute to get there. First, thanks so much for a fantastic talk. Someone who doesn't work on plasticity, who really wonderful story. That I think I was able to follow, but we'll find out. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Right. so one of the things that strikes me is that um, uh, it is this really blazing signal that um, uh, high-confidence RB Fox targets are enriched for idiopathic autism. Yeah. Then you have a situation where um, you can rescue um, uh, the RB Fox um, uh, knockout with BAMP1. And and, um, uh, and and so that would seem like that's a really important function, right? A really strong signal from the phenotype. Um, but I, as far as I know, VAMP1 mutations are not a risk factor for autism. Right? It's like uh, spastic ataxia, so there's another phenotype. So what I'm wondering is, um, is, is there any information on kind of whether or not there are alternative um, uh, developmental phenotypes from RB Fox mutations? Um, that if the targets of RB Fox are involved in autism, um, but it seems like what you're looking at when you're looking at the electrophysiological kind of most striking phenotype from the knockout, maybe leading you someplace else, it would seem like it still must be an important function of RB Fox, um, but it might be different or... You, I, I, I think you got it. <laughs> I think that's the first part that... Um, second of all, I think, you know, I would imagine that that mutations in, there are a lot of lethal mutations in, in VAMP1. So I do think that what we're looking at here, um, I'm not claiming that it's telling you exactly about what is the, the role of, of RB Fox1 in human disease. But by looking at the mechanisms of the way that RB, that it regulates one of these targets that we can manipulate and we can get a really high signal to noise, it, you know, and I think that we're, you're right, we're looking at one phenotype, right? We're looking at increased excitability. And I assume that there are other phenotypes. And certainly in that RB Fox 1 knockout mouse, um, there were a, it was a little discouraging the amount of the, the phenotype that was available. That was the phenotype. And actually, when you look at the changes in gene expression, there are far fewer than there are in our double RB Fox 1 3 knockdown. And I'm sure I expect that's because there's also RB Fox 2 and RB Fox 3. And so it's this level of, you know, for us, what we're doing is we're playing with these particular levers so that we can learn something about the cell biology. I assume that this would, this. I don't believe that um, you get development without FAMP1. There is one uh, hypomorph for FAMP1 in, in, that's available in a rat, I think. Um, and I haven't read to see, uh, much about what the phenotype of that is, but that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Hi. 
John. So in terms of thinking of plasticity and the window that the uh, CPC was regulated, if you force nuclear expression, does that alter what the thresholds are for plasticity locally? If you force expression, it's like it's like it's like it's so if you take like a constituent nuclear isoform and then you stimulate it in synapse, do you actually see different thresholds for what? Well, that's a good, yeah, we could do that experiment. We haven't done that, but we, we have those constructs that have the constitutively nuclear isoform. We're doing experiments using proximity ligation assays to see what they're binding to in the nucleus, and so we could look to see what happens at the level of plasticity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the two systems you talked about, part one and part two, what do they do in other parts of the body? Are, they, is, are these systems active in other tissues and other yeah. regulatory yeah. activities? Well, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So you get, you know, CHC1 is, plays a really active role in uh, um, beta islet cells uh, and other hepatic cells and regulating glucose levels. Um, the uh, you know trafficking of RNAs out to sites. It's an interesting thing because developmentally, um, RNA localization, and I think a lot of post-translational post-transcription regulation is thought of, in particular, you know, especially RNA localization and, and sort of localized translation, is thought of as a way of um, determining the fate of a compartment of a cell. So whether it's a budding yeast, whether it's a fibroblast in the leading edge, that compartment of the cell is really different from the rest because those RNAs are localized and, and translated there. Um, and if you look, there was a really beautiful study maybe 10 years ago doing in-situ hybridization in Drosophila and looking at localized RNAs. And all of the, the RNA localization mirrored the protein localization, so it really suggested that the RNA localization defined the proteome locally. And so that's different here. And I think that it's different because I think you, again, I think you want every part of the neuronal arbor to be sort of ready to change, which is different from what you want in the developmental state where you want to acquire a fate in a particular compartment of the cell. What's so amazing about what you described is the enormity of the changes, the number of things go up and down in response to which we need. So does that mean that, that there's potentially for a lot of redundancy in case anything yeah. screws up or I mean, well, when you say enormity, what do you, do you mean amplitude or number? Because I'm actually the number of things that are responding. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I think there's probably a lot of redundancy. I mean, we've done. We just have an amazing student in the lab who's done the beautiful study where she wanted to identify other proteins that go from the synapse to the nucleus, and so she did uh, proximity ligation assay, looking at you know with a nuclear localized um, apex two and look for changes and use the same stimulation that we see CHC1 going to the nucleus. And we detected new things, but it wasn't a ton. And I assume that's, you know, to me that was a little bit surprising. So I don't, I, you know, I think there are a lot of changes. I think there's redundancy. I mean, RBFOX3, there's, you know, RBFOX1, there's clearly redundancy there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know how the changes we're seeing, certainly at the RNA, uh, transcriptome level, um, that, we see really 125 changes. That's, yeah, I don't think that's very much. I don't think that's very much. I don't, and I don't, and they're not huge amplitude. No, 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 it is, it is, but I, I just think it's much more, you know, I mean, homeostasis is a lot more complicated than, you know, I think, yeah, it is. It's no, it is, it, and it's a little bit discouraging having come from, you know, a lab where we thought there were master switches. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but that's reality. You know, we live in a much more, our brains, thank God, are more homeostatic than, than and, 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 and,